Welcome to episode 78 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue the tale of Troy and the conclusion of the battle, Diomedes. In the meantime, Stenelus, obedient to his friend's command, had taken the horses and the chariot of Aeneas to the ships and now returned to Diomedes in his own chariot. With the clear vision Athene had given him, the son of Tydeus had recognized Aphrodite. He followed her through the din of battle and soon caught up with her as she bore away her son. The hero thrust at her with his lance, and the point pierced the skin of her soft hand so that it began to bleed. The wounded goddess screamed and let Aeneas fall to the ground. Then she hurried to Ares, her brother, whom she found seated on the left of the battle. His chariot and horses hidden in cloud. Oh, brother, she pleaded, take me away. Give me your horses that I may quickly flee to Olympus. My hand hurts. Diomedes, a mortal, has wounded me. I believe he would fight against our father Zeus himself. Ares let her have his chariot, and while Aphrodite reached Olympus, she threw herself weeping into the arms of Dione, her mother, who caressed and comforted her and guided her to the father of the gods. He received her with a smile. Now you see, sweet daughter, he said, why the business of war was not entrusted to you. Let your work be to arrange weddings and leave battles to Ares. But her sister Pallas and Hera looked at her askance and taunted her. What is all that about? they asked maliciously. That beautiful and false woman from Greece most probably lured our sister to Troy. There she must have passed her hand over Helen's gown and scratched herself on a clasp. Down on the battlefield, meanwhile, Diomedes had thrown himself upon Aeneas. Three times he lunged forward to deal him the death blow, and three times wrathful Apollo, who had hurried to the spot where Aphrodite's departure, held his shield over the wounded man. When Diomedes lifted a sword a fourth time, the god threatened him in a terrible voice, Mortal, do not venture to vie with gods! Abashed, Diomedes faltered and drew back. Apollo bore Aeneas out of the battle and carried him to the temple in Troy where Leto, his mother, and Artemis, his sister, took him into their care. On the ground where the hero had lain, the god shaped a phantom in his image, and the Achaeans and Trojans alike began to fight for it with savage blows and thrusts. Then Apollo bade Ares try to remove from battle the insolent son of Tydeus, who fought against the immortals themselves and the war god, in the shape of the Thracians. Achamus mingled with a crowd of warriors and approached the sons of Priam to reprove them. How much longer, O princes, will you permit that Argive to commit his murders? Will you wait until the fighting reaches the very gates of your city? Do you not know that Aeneas has fallen? Come, let us save our comrade from the hands of our foe. In this way, Ares moved the hearts of the Trojans, and Sarpedon, king of the Lycaeans, went up to Hector. What has become of that famous courage of yours, he asked. Only a little while ago you boasted that without allies, yes, even without an army, you and your brothers and brother-in-law would be enough to defend Troy. Yet now I do not see a single one of them in the battle. They are all crouched like dogs before a lion, and we allies are forced to keep out the fight alone. In his heart, Hector felt that he deserved reproof. He sprang down from his chariot, brandishing his lance, strode through the ranks, inciting all who crossed his path, and set the conflict blaze afresh. His brothers and the other Trojans again turned their faces towards the foe, and Apollo healed Aeneas, filled him with new strength, and sent him back to the field, where he appeared among his men quite suddenly and wholly sound. They all rejoiced. No one took the time to ask questions, but all rushed forward to the battle. The Argives with Diomedes, the two Agassiz and Odysseus and their band awaited the impact, calm and motionless as a bank of clouds. And Agamemnon hurried through the ranks, calling, Now, my friends, be men and have faith in your own powers. When a people has faith in itself, more men stand than fall. 
but for him who flees, there is neither help nor glory. So he spoke, and was the first to fling his spear at the Trojans. It struck the friend of Aeneas, Diacum, who always fought in the forefront. But the mighty hand of Aeneas slew two of the bravest Achaeans, Crithon and Orsilochus, sons of Diocles, who is Fury in the Peloponnesus, had grown up together, sturdy as mountain and lions, and Menelaus grieved for them as he raised his spear and flung himself into the fight. Ares spurred him onward, for he hoped Aeneas would fell him to the ground. But Antichus, son of Nestor, fearing for the life of the king, sprang to his side at the very moment the two were preparing to rush at each other with their lances. When Aeneas saw two heroes confront him, he drew back. Menelaus and Antichus saved the two bodies from the hands of their foes and put them in the care of friends. Then they returned to the onslaught. Menelaus stabbed Pylamenes, and Antichus drove his sword into the temple of Maidon, his charioteer, so that he fell from the chariot and stood head first in the deep dust until his own horses, which Antichus was driving toward the archives, knocked him over and trampled him underfoot. Hector stormed forward with the bravest of the Trojan warriors, and the war god accompanied him, going now before and now behind him. When Diomedes saw Ares coming, he paused in wonder, as a traveler stops to marvel at a thundering waterfall, and called to the people, Do not be amazed at Hector's fearlessness, my friends, for our god is at his side, shielding him from harm. And so, if we are forced to retreat, we shall be retreating from the gods. While he was speaking, the Trojans came nearer and nearer, and Hector slew two bold Achaeans, Aeschylus and Menethus, both in one chariot. Ajax, son of Telamon, wanted to avenge them. With his lance, he strung Amphus as ally of the Trojans under the belt, and he crashed to the ground. Then he pressed his foot against the body and drew out his lance, but a hail of spears prevented him from stripping his victim of his armor. The other part of the field, evil chance, drove Typolemus, a descendant of Heracles, towards Sarpedon, to whom he called from afar, Why are you still here shaking with terror, you weakling from Asia, who lyingly boast that you are son of Zeus, like Heracles, my father? You are a coward, but even if you had courage, you should not escape Hades. Had I won no glory before this, Sarpedon replied, I should now gain it by your death. As the last word left his lips, the two heroes raised their lances, and Sarpedon pierced his overbearing foe right through the throat. The weapon's point came out at the nape of the neck, and he sank dead upon the earth. But the spear of Tipolemus pierced Sarpedon's left thigh to the bone. He would have died had it not been for Zeus, his father, who wanted his son to live. His friends led him through the battlefield. He was trembling with pain, but they went so swiftly that no one noticed he was still dragging with him the lance stuck in his leg. The Argives, in the meantime, carried off the body of Tipolemus. When Odysseus raged through the leaderless troops of the Lycaeans and came close to Sarpedon, as he withdrew from the fight, the son of Zeus caught sight of Hector and called to him in a weak voice, Son of Priam, do not leave me here as the prey of the Argives. Defend me so that if I can return to the land of my fathers, to my wife and my little son, I may at least breathe my last undisturbed in your city. Hector did not take time to answer. He drove back to the Argives around Sarpedon with such vigor that even Odysseus did not venture to advance. The Trojan warriors laid Sarpedon down near the Skyan gates, under a tall beech tree sacred to Zeus, and Pelagon, the friend of his youth, drew the spear from his thigh. For a moment the wounded man lost consciousness, but soon he revived and a cool wind blowing from the north freshened his languid spirit.' 
And now, Ares and Hector pressed upon the Argives until they were forced to retreat to their ships. Hector, unaided, slew six splendid heroes, stricken with horror. Hera gazed down from the Olympus and saw the slaughter the Trojans were accomplishing with the help of Ares. Then the mother of all the gods ordered her chariot made ready. The chariot with its bronze wheels rimmed with gold, the silver shaft and the golden yoke to which Hera harnessed her fleet-footed horses. Athene, meanwhile, girt on her father's armor, set the gold helmet on her head, took the shield blazoned with the gorgon's head, grasped the spear and the mounted the silver car, bound the axle with chains of gold. Hera stood beside her and used her goad so that the horses moved with even greater speed. The gates of heaven guarded by the hours opened of themselves, and the great goddess passed the jagged slopes of Olympus. On the highest peak sat Zeus, reigning in her team for an instant. Hera, his wife, called to him, Are you not angry that Ares, your son, is harassing the Achaeans, contrary to the will of fate? Aphrodite and Apollo exult because they have succeeded in rousing the war god to do as they wish. Now surely you will permit me to strike that impudent wretch a blow that will send him flying from the field. <laughs> you may try, Zeus answered her from his peak. Send my daughter Athene against him, for she is venomous and strong and knows how to fight. And now the chariot sped on between starry heaven and earth until it descended, where the Simwa and the Scamander joined their waters. There the horses touched the ground. The goddesses at once hastened into the midst of battle, where warriors bold as lions and boars were fighting around the son of Tydeus. Hera, in the shape of Stentor, mingled with them and called aloud in the bronze of the hero whose form she had assumed, and her voice rang like bronze. Shame on you, Argives! Are you a terror to your foes only when Achilles fights at your side? Now that he stays with the ships, you cannot succeed. Her taunts rallied the courage of the Argives, and Athene fought her way to Diomedes. She found him standing beside her, his chariot, trying to bind up the wound he had received from the shaft of Pandurus. His broad shield weighed on him, the sweat streamed from his body, and his hands were powerless. It was an effort for him even to loosen the strap and wipe away the blood. Athene leaned on the horse's yoke and said to him, "'The son of Tydeus is most unlike his father.' He was small in stature, and yet the bravest of fighters. Before the wall of Thebes he fought against my will, but such was his pluck and daring that I would not deny him my aid. You too could claim my protection and help, were it not for— But I cannot say just what is the matter with you. Are you stiff with striking blows, or has fear clouded your mind and numbed your limbs? Whatever the cause may be, to me you do not seem the son of a fiery Tydeus. At her words, Diomedes raised his eyes to her face and looked at her wonderingly as he said, I recognize you, daughter of Zeus, and I shall tell you the plain truth. Neither fear nor slackness hold me back, but one of the mightiest among the gods. You yourself opened my eyes that I might know him. It is Ares, the god of war, whom I have been directing the attack of the Trojans. That is why I fell back and commanded the other Achaeans to gather here around me. Then Athene replied, Diomedes, my chosen friend, from now on you shall fear neither Ares nor any other immortal, for I shall be at your side. Guide your horses straight towards the raging god himself. Thus she spoke and lightly touched Stentilus, his charioteer, who willingly dismounted so that she herself could ride beside Diomedes. The axle groaned under the weight of the goddess and the boldest among the Argive heroes. She at once took reins and goad and drove the horses at Ares. He was just stripping off the armor of Periphus, the hardiest of the Attilians, when he saw Diomedes coming toward him at his chariot. The goddess had veiled herself in impenetrable mist. 
he let Periphas lie and hasten toward the son of Tydeus, leaning forward over the yoke and the reins of his horse and aiming his lance. But Athene, unseen by anyone, laid her hand on it and gave it a different course so that it slanted off into the empty air. And now Diomedes aimed, and the fiend herself directed his spear so that it pierced Ares in the groin. The god of war roared as loudly as ten thousand mortals put together, and Trojans and Argives alike trembled, for they thought that through the sky was blue and serene they were hearing the thunder of Zeus. Only Diomedes saw Ares sheathed in cloud and riding up to heaven as if carried on a great gust of wind. There the war god seated himself beside Zeus, his father, and showed him the blood running from his wound. But the thunderer looked at him sternly and said, <laughs> My son, do not whine complaints to me. Of all the Olympians, you displease me most. You have always been fond of fighting and quarrels, and more than any other, you resemble your mother in your stubborn, rebellious ways. It must be she who is responsible for this trouble of yours. All the same, I cannot bear to see you suffer. The healer among the gods shall tend you. And he called Pion, who examined the wound and treated it so that it closed, and soon he was whole and well again. In the meantime, the other gods had also returned to Olympus and left the Trojans and denied to themselves. First, Ajax, son of Telamon, broke the ranks of the Trojans and cleared away for his men by piercing between the eyes of Alchemus, greatest among the Thracians. Then Diomedes slew Axylus and his charioteer. Three other Trojans fell by the hand of Eurylus. Pilates by that of Odysseus, Teucer to slew Aretone, Teucer slew Aretone, Anticlus killed Ablerus, and Agamemnon Elatus. Menelaus caught hold of Adrastus just as his horses stumbled and threw him to the ground, running off toward the city with other leaderless horses and dragging the chariot with them. The foe lying in the dust clasped the king's knees and implored him, Take me prisoner, son of Atreus. You shall have a ransom of bronze and gold from the stores of my father, who will gladly give it to you if only he can clasp me alive in his arms again. The heart of Menelaus was moved, but just then Agamemnon came toward him and said reproachfully, Have you pity on your foes, Menelaus? Not one shall escape our revenge, not even the child at a mother's breast. All whom Troy has reared must die without mercy. When Menelaus heard these words, he thrust pleading Adrestus from him, and Agamemnon pierced his body with a lance. Incessantly, Nestor's call rang out among the Argives. Friends, do not stay behind to strip or loot. Now all that count is to kill. Later on, we can take the weapons of the dead at our leisure. The Trojans would have been vanquished and forced to flee back to their city had not Helenus, Priam's son, who could predict the future from the flight of birds, turned to Hector and Aeneas and said to them, All now depends on you. If you can stop the men before they enter the gates, we shall be able to resume the battle of the Argives. Aeneas, the gods, has chosen you for this task, and you, Hector, shall go to Troy and give a message to our mother. Tell her to assemble the noblest women on the Acropolis in the temple of Athene to place her most precious robe on the knees of the goddess and vow to sacrifice to her twelve unblemished heifers if only she will take pity on the Trojan women, their children, and their city and ward off the terrible son of Tydeus. Willingly, Hector sprang from his chariot, strode through his battalions, spurring their courage, and then hastened toward the city. And here is where I end my tale for today. Could I be back with more tales? Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey. <laughs>